Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll be talking about language and psychosis today. Um, so for those of you who are psychiatrists or interact with people, you know that uh, language is very important. It carries a lot of information. For psychiatrists, it's how we make diagnoses, how we communicate with each other, uh, how we actually um, are therapeutic. We use language. Pinker said that language is a window into the mind. Um, as I said, it's a primary source of data for diagnosis and treatment. Uh, language is very easy and inexpensive to capture and transcribe. All you really need is a microphone uh, and a recording device, uh, such as an iPhone. It's really big data at the level of the individual. And um, language production, in anticipation of Ruth Cuth Cuthbert's uh, talk, is one of the RDOC. Um, uh, domains and corpus-based linguistic analysis, which is sort of natural language processing, and which I'll introduce, is uh, uh, one of the uh, levels for analyzing RDOC language production. So I do research on schizophrenia. We are trying to figure out what's going on with schizophrenia. We still just have Thorazine. Um, and so I look at people who are at risk for schizophrenia, among whom uh, about 25% develop schizophrenia, so we can look at the pathophysiology in a developmental context. So schizophrenia um, is characterized even long before people become psychotic uh, from disturbances in language. These are just sort of cohort studies of uh, which people, kids, uh, got different kinds of assessments. Uh, but uh, So even as toddlers, individuals who go on to develop schizophrenia have delays in talking. They have some speech impairments. Uh, we get records of people. We see that often they've had simple language impairment as children. And in schizophrenia, there's an acceleration of symptoms in adolescence during the teen years. This is known as the prodrome, clinical high risk, ultra high risk, uh, characterized by academic decline, social withdrawal, and the emergence of psychotic-like symptoms that aren't threshold in nature. So that includes unusual thought content, which is the form fruit of delusions, perceptual disturbances, suspiciousness, but also subtle disturbances in language. Um, and I do this clinical high-risk data. Um, I have colleagues who have looked at data from familial high-risk, um, finding that um, for, based on audio uh, 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 tapes of children at age nine who have parents with schizophrenia, that uh, ratings of their language uh, predicts who develops schizophrenia 10 years later with an accuracy of 94%. So among clinical high-risk uh, patients, I have a colleague, Carrie Bearden at UCLA, who took on the tough task of manual linguistic analysis, really very labor-intensive. Um, and so what we do, we sort of evaluate people at baseline and we follow them. So she did this linguistic analysis when people first came in. It's called the story game. Uh, children have to re tell their own stories and recall a story that they've heard. And uh, the ratings were illogical thinking and poverty of content, illogical thinking for the clinicians in the crowd. It kind of goes along with um, being tangential, uh, derailment, circumstantial, what we call a kind of positive thought disorder and goes with the psychotic-like symptoms in schizophrenia. Poverty of content, uh, you see an example there, maybe, yes, well, I see, and you can certainly see how I went to school today because my name is Tom, is logical. But poverty of content is associated with the negative symptoms that characterize schizophrenia, motivational deficits, in terms of not really wanting to do things or not thinking that you'll enjoy things. Uh, so when she did this manual linguistic analysis, she found that ratings of a lot thinking and poverty of content characterized those individuals who went on to develop schizophrenia within two years. So that's great, and so it brings us to sort of natural language processing and automated linguistic analysis, which is being done in the whole rest of the world. Why not psychiatry? Um, and so uh, we and others have taken an approach of looking at semantic coherence, and that's to sort of index this being tangential, circumstantial, and syntactic complex complexity, which is to index more of this sort of negative symptom kind of poverty of speech. 
uh, their natural language processing and machine learning techniques to quantify them. Um, and I've collaborated with Guillermo. So um, in terms of semantic coherence, there was this beautiful work done by Landauer in the late 1990s um, in which uh, basically he had uh, computers go over very large corpuses of text uh, and then the computer would look at um, the co-occurrence of words with one another. You could. Uh, um, assign each word a semantic vector, you could sort of understand its meaning based on um, how it has been used in different contexts. And he argued that this is not so different from how children learn language and even came up with the uh, same learning curve. Um, so with latent semantic analysis, each word is assigned a sem semantic vector, 300 to 400 dimensions seems to uh, work best. And um, for the clinicians in the crowd, if you remember uh, when you learned about vectors, uh, if you have a series of vectors and you sum them, you just, you know, sort of the arrows all kind of go together. You can, so we could look at sen uh, semantic vectors at the sentence level as, w as well as the word level. And this is just an example uh, to show that you could create these. It's a heuristic, it's not real data. Uh, but you can create these vectors and you could see where people go off track just basically by looking at the cosine between successive vectors. So that's semantic coherence. Part of speech tagging is a little more straightforward. Uh, again, for the older people in the crowd, if you remember at the blackboard, finding uh, your teacher drawing these trees. So each word can be assigned not just a semantic vector, but a syntactic vector as well. And some words, of course, can be noun or verb, depending on the context. Uh, but uh, you can t tag each word uh, for part of speech. So we uh, had these clinical high-risk patients. We had open-ended interviews, and we decided to analyze them in respect to natural language processing, latent semantic analysis, and part of speech tagging. These were sort of old interviews that were lying around and had been transcribed for qualitative research. So we knew who developed psychosis and who did not. Uh, so the best model that we came up with was a semantic coherence uh, variable, the minimum during the course of the interview. We also found two syntactic measures of complexity. One was the length of sentences, which you could figure out with part of speech tagging and grammatical rules, and also a reduced use of words such as which or that which introduce uh, dependent clauses. So this is a complex, complex hull. This is a machine learning approach. And this is basically the shrink wrapping of data within a set. So it's a, a convex hull is a complex, uh, it's the set of data points and the smallest complex polyhedron. And so what we found is that the individuals who did not develop psychosis are inside of this convex hull and the people who converted were outside. We found 100% accuracy, but it was a very small sample, and this is more proof of principle. So, um, and we validated this in a number of ways. Uh, one thing was that Guillermo took classic literary texts and uh, induced scrambling uh, in the text. It was able to induce this sort of decrease in semantic coherence. We also found it was highly correlated with clinical symptoms but outperformed it in prediction. Um, and the classifier also discriminated, again, this is a convex hull, the speech of he healthy individuals from those with schizophrenia. And each of these convex hulls that Guillermo creates, we always find the normal people or the people who don't develop psychosis on the inside and the people who develop psychosis being on the outside. And again, this is these same parameters for semantic coherence and the, the complexity. So I told you about the manual linguistics study early on, and so my colleague was very kind and said, you know what, let me give you my data. Why don't you guys do this machine learning and see what comes out with it? So Guillermo created a machine learning classifier based on um, that story game data that I told you about. And the classifier within, 
oh, the classifier within test uh, had an 83% accuracy. That's pretty good, but the classifier was derived from the data itself. However, when we took that classifier and applied it to my data from New York City, it had a 79% uh, accuracy. Further, when we then applied it to some more first episode psychosis in healthy individuals at UCLA, it had 72% accuracy. So the, it, although it's all very new, this seems to have legs and seems to be robust, uh, that there are these uh, coherence aspects and reduction in complexity that characterizes psychosis even before people develop psychosis. This last uh, convex hull on the bottom was the machine learning classifier from UCLA, my colleague Carrie Bearden, applied to my data set, and you could see that these convex hulls overlap. We don't understand yet what's, what really characterizes what's going on normally, um, but uh, we'll do some studies. I just want to show these two. This, this, these are examples. So I have two examples. I want you to tell me which one do you think developed psychosis. So this first one is, so I used to play at hunting and stuff. I don't know. I was alone a lot. I used to like, I mean, until my little sister was born. Then I used to like change her diapers and stuff. I don't know. Then elementary school and stuff. When I was little, I was kind of slow in school. I mean, I could read fast and stuff, but I had no one ever diagnosed it. But I suspect I had ADHD because I was always daydreaming and the teachers would tell my mom I was retarded or something because I'd be like, let's say you're writing ABC in kindergarten and everyone else had already finished and I would still be at D. So this is one transcript. But this is the other. Like, have you ever heard of Steal This Book by Abby Hoffman? Well, it's about, if you're about living, if you let down your society, how to shoplift and things. And you know, I thought that was interesting. But I couldn't, uh, I don't think I would have the nerve. Like, I've never shoplifted before. I don't have the nerve, and I try to think it's like an easy way to, you don't need a job, but with like shoplifting, it's an easy way to rebel and stuff, not to oversimplify. So I will ask you, hands, show of hands. So who thought the first person developed psychosis? Yes, and who thought the second person did? Oh, it was actually the first person. And, and, and this does also not seem terribly coherent, but you'll see that it's really thematically all about the same thing. Um, this sort of like shoplifting with the, which the individual returns to, whereas the other one was even a little bit uh, more coherent. So that's uh, language and just using transcripts. We haven't even started to look vis-a-vis -vis psychosis in respect to, pro well, we have started to look with prosody. We're finding pauses are related to negative symptoms. Um, we want to uh, work with Justin Baker with the setup that he has for schizophrenia for looking at face action units and gesture and really look at that in these individuals at clinical risk and see uh, its predictive value. So so and, um, I have two uh, grants that I'm doing now. One is to really figure out the mechanistic aspect of these problems in language. Um, so we're doing uh, EEG for auditory mismatch, which is associated with language disturbance across disorders. We're using a task by Uri Hassan at Princeton where you scramble text. And um, when people hear when people hear stories or language, all of us, in fact, right now, to the extent that you're listening, uh, I am in training in you a time course for your bold activation, and you're all synchronized, except for the ones who are sleeping. Um, and um, so it seems like in schizophrenia patients, when they hear stories, they're not synchronizing as well with everyone else. We're looking at that in clinical high risk. And then I put up this map. We're not doing this, but I just think it's very interesting. Um, by, from Jack Gallen's lab where they have mapped uh, semantic content to the uh, cortex. And you can't see, but the sort of pinkish, orangish colors are more sort of social and affiliative content words, mostly in the temporal cortex, more sort of mathematic, uh, technical words. Uh, kind of mapping more to parietal cortex. And what we hope to do, as I started out saying schizophrenia remains this mystery, is really understand some of these early disturbances before people develop psychosis and get meds and get demoralized and figure out which circuits are impaired. Perhaps it is the language circuit, among others, and then use uh, non-invasive brain stimulation to try to treat that. And thank you.